Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to NUPI and welcome to this uh, seminar on uh, how does the Norwegian oil fund affect the company t uh, companies it has an ownership stake in. Uh, my name is uh, Morten Bøås. I'm a research professor here at NUPI, where among other duties, I'm also the co-share of something called the TaxCap Dev Network. And it's the TaxCap Dev Network, which is a uh, Norwegian but also slightly international research network that um, unites and connects uh, both research, uh, researchers and stakeholders that are interested in issues concerning taxation, capital development, um, with a particular sort of interest also in issues concerning state building and uh, taxation that is ho hosting this seminar. We are very happy to have uh, Knut Christian Myre here, um, who is a senior researcher at the University of uh, Oslo who will be talking about uh, and explore the instruments by which the Norwegian Government Pension Fund, Global, or the Oil Fund, as it's often uh, popularly referred to, how will this fund seeks to influence the activities of cooperation, which is uh, taken, um, which is, has an ownership stake in. And uh, Knut Christian's talk will, uh, presentation will will focus in particularly on the so-called seven expectations documents that, um, uh, that address how companies in this portfolio should address global chain, uh, challenges in their operations. Uh, Knut Christian has a wide background before he started uh, with this. Um, he is, as I said, a senior researcher at the Museum of Cultural History at the University of Oslo. Uh, he's trained in philosophy and uh, social anthropology, so it's a social anthropologist that is visiting us today, and I think it's quite interesting that Knut Christian's project, which is called Forms of Ethics, Shape of Finance, Ethnographic Exploration of the Limits of Contemporary Capital, which is, this is really the only major research project in Norway, at least financed by the Norwegian Research Council, that actually looks into and critically examines this particular uh, fund and the implications of it. And I think that's quite interesting, in fact. Um, previously, Knut Christian has had, a, has had a long and distinguished career as an anthropologist, mainly working in Africa and in rural Africa, in Tanzania, um, among other places. And he's the author of um, a widely cited book called Returning Life, Language, Life Force and History in Kilimanjaro. But you have moved from, um, from the villages around Kilimanjaro into the boardroom of really high capital in Norway and internationally. So I really uh, look forward to your talk and your presentation. Knut Christian is going to talk for uh, about 40 minutes. Thereafter, we will open it up for uh, comments and questions uh, from the floor. And we sort of aim to end this uh, seminar at around uh, 3.30. It depends a little bit, of course, on how much uh, comments and questions that you are able to, um, to, um, to attract from the audience. But with that said, I mean, Knut Christian, the floor is yours. And Marie is now looking at me and reminding me that I should tell you that we are streaming this event. You can, if you want to, uh, share it and look at it uh, at the uh, NUPI's YouTube uh, channel thereafter. But just keep in mind that we are streaming this event. And that also means that when we come to the Q&A session, um, if you raise your hand, you will be part of this, this the streamed event. So then there will be a mic passed around. And then also please, state your name and uh, affiliation. So with uh, that said, Knut Christian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Morten, for that <coughs> introduction. And thank you also for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here and to be allowed to contribute to this uh, seminar series. So today I'm going to present some ideas and arguments from a paper that I'm currently developing with my collaborator, Douglas Holmes, for this year's annual meeting of the American Anthropological Association. This paper comes out of uh, work conducted as part of the research project that Morton mentioned, which is entitled Forms of Ethics, Shapes of Finance, uh, and that I lead at the Museum of Cultural History, which is part of the University of Oslo. As Morton mentioned, this project takes as its object of study the Government Pension Fund Global, 
that I abbreviate here as GPFG. And as Morten has already uh, revealed, the Government Pension Fund Global is the official name for the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, which is otherwise more commonly known as the Oil Fund. This fund was established by law in 1990, and its current objective is to support government saving and support long-term considerations in the use of, of the petroleum revenues. These revenues that accrue in the fund derive from taxes levied on the production of oil and gas in the Norwegian sector of the North Sea and the income and dividends that are generated from the state's involvement in these activities. The fund is owned by the Norwegian people but is managed by a division of the central bank entitled Norges Bank Investment Management or NBIM. This is uh, Norges Bank's own representation of the governance model for the fund which I have uh, borrowed for this occasion. Now the fund is a financial investor which means that it may only hold minority stakes and that NBIM conduct portfolio management to diversify investments and reduce the risk of the fund. The basis for this is a management mandate that is issued by the Ministry of Finance to Norges Bank, and that is represented by one of these arrows going down. Uh, this mandate stipulates the percentage of the fund that NBIM may invest in different asset classes and sets a limit for how far their returns may deviate from global benchmark indices. The mandate decrees that Norges Bank may only invest the fund outside Norway and that it may not hold more than 10% of the shares in any given company. As a result, the fund holds stocks in more than 9,100 corporations in 73 countries and it owns on average 1.4% of all listed shares in the world. It also holds a wide range of government and, and corporate bonds and a real estate portfolio of commercial properties in select locations. The market value of these investments exceeds 9,800 9, billion Norwegian krona, or a little over 1 trillion US dollars. This is a screenshot from NBIM's website where there is a ticker, uh, and I saw a uh, a news item online just before coming here that the fund hit, uh, well, the market value hit a new all time high this morning of nearly 10,000 billion krona. Now, in my research, I explore how GPFG conducts and involves what I call custodial finance. By this, I mean that the fund serves to meet a multiplicity of social commitments and therefore acts with a multitude of others in mind. Central in this regard is the law which states that the capital of the government pension fund may only be used for transfers to the central government budget pursuant to a resolution by Stortinget, the Norwegian Parliament. This provision means that the fund, despite its name, has no pension liabilities. Instead, transfers from the fund cover the annual fiscal budget deficit. A fiscal spending rule, Handlingsregel, stipulates that such transfers shall not exceed the expected real returns of the fund, estimated at 3% of its market value. In line with this, such transfers in recent years nevertheless cover nearly 20% of the annual fiscal budget. The fund thereby meets an equal share of all state expenditures and a fraction of all the social commitments these entail. As the spending rule constrains such transfers, it sustains the capital of the fund and makes it a fund from which future generations also may benefit. Accordingly, NBIM status their mission, we work to safeguard and build financial wealth for future generations. 
So on this basis, our project broadly investigates what it means to manage great wealth on behalf of others, including those who are not yet born. And we explore the role a large sovereign wealth fund plays in a well-functioning democracy. Phrased differently, I am interested in what it means to manage a fund, manage a large fund that holds minority stakes in a great number of the world's corporations on behalf of the current and future citizens of a small nation state. Now, the starting point for this particular paper was the launch of two related NBIM publications that occurred in early September last year. One publication was this one, an asset manager perspective entitled The Sustainable Development Goals and the Government Pension Fund Global. And the second one was this one, an, expect an expectation document entitled Ocean Sustainability. As the title suggests, the first publication inquires into the significance of the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs, for business and industry, and discusses which of these are of particular importance for GPFG. The second publication pertains to one specific SDG, and that is number 14, Life Below Water. This expectation document is the seventh such publication to appear since 2008. In order of publications, the previous documents concern children's rights, climate change, water management, human rights, tax and transparency, and anti-corruption. These documents are central to NBIM's exercise of ownership that forms part of its responsible investment activities. This means that NBIM direct these expectations at their portfolio companies. They use these documents in the company dialogue that operates in tandem with their voting at, share, at annual shareholder meetings. And together, the dialogue and the voting constitute their primary and prioritized means for the exercise of ownership. According to NBIM, they conducted 3,256 dialogue meetings with 1,420 1, corporations in 2018. That year, NBIM also voted on 113,546 resolutions at over 11,000 annual shareholder meetings. That is no mean feat. NBIM based their voting on their publicly available global voting guidelines and on six position papers that concern specific aspects of corporate governance. The position papers also employ, along with the expectation documents in the company dialogue, and together with the asset manager perspectives, they ground NBIM's engagement in the development of international standards and principles for markets and corporations. Now, these considerations show that NBIM have developed a multitude of instruments for influencing the practices of the corporations in which the fund has an ownership stake. In our paper, we explore these instruments with a particular focus on the expectation documents. And for this purpose, we draw on public sources as well as conversations that I have conducted with the individuals involved in the creation and use of these documents. And on the basis of this, we investigate how NBIM's expectations emerge from an extensive communicative field that involves a multitude of different actors. We moreover explore how those involved in this field draw on and seek to further in a host of international principles to facilitate the integration of environmental, social and governance agendas as objectives of the corporations. We analyze how these documents mobilize multinational corporations to address concerns that affect life and well-being in a broad sense. On this basis, we argue that the documents reform how corporations engage issues of welfare. We claim that these issues exceed the ambit of the nation state 
and recast the managerial practices of the corporations and thereby expand the custodial finance of the fund. Now from this copy, and we can pass this around so you can look at it if you wish, um, you can then see the, the form and layout of the expectation document on ocean sustainability. And the same form recurs in all these documents despite their very different subject matters. Each one consists of a handful of pages that first provide a summary of the document and a brief introduction of NBIM. Its three main sections then account for the purpose of the document and the relevance of its topic before it specifies the actual expectations towards the corporations. The starting point for NBIM's expectations is the key characteristic of the fund as a large, long-term and global investor. Oh, sorry. Um, this characteristic stems from the law and mandate that I mentioned earlier, which, serves, which serve to sequester the petroleum revenues and diversify investments for the benefit of future generations. In line with this, the document on ocean sustainability states that, and I quote here, the fund with its global exposure across industries and markets has an inherent interest in the sustainable use of the oceans that does not compromise the ability of future generations to continue using it to meet their own needs. This claim invokes the classic definition of sustainable development that was proposed by the 1987 UN World Commission on Environment and Development. That definition also underpins the sustainable development goals that were adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2015. Accordingly, NBIM's asset manage, ma manager perspective states that the UN Sustainable Development Goals set out an ambitious policy agenda to achieve sustainable economic, social and environmental development by 2030. As a long-term and global owner, the Government Pension Fund Global has an interest in a more sustainable global economy. Achieving the SDGs in both developed and developing countries could contribute to the long-term returns of the fund through increased economic resilience. On this basis, one can see that NBIM conceive of their concern for sustainable economic practices as an effect of the fund and its character. However, the concern also relates to the role that concepts and documents from international discourses, such as the SDG ag agenda, play as departure points for the expectation documents. For instance, NBIM state in the document on ocean sustainability that we will, as a starting point and where appropriate, base our practices on internationally recognized standards such as the UN Global Compact, the, U the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, the G20 OECD Principles of Corporate Governance, and OECD Guidelines for Multinational Enterprises. Similar statements can be found in all these expectation documents where NBIM also make wide use of these standards. In addition, they draw on reports and conventions by these organizations that are mentioned here to document and underwrite their expectations. At the same time, sources reveal that NBIM do not simply rely on such documents. In addition, they actively involve others in drafting their expectations. These actors include academic researchers, national and international NGOs, as well as legal experts and put select portfolio companies. By sharing drafts and seeking comments, NBIM mobilize a range of expertise and competencies and anchor their expectations in a multitude of positions and perspectives. These then bestow a public and democratic legitimacy and they ensure a broad and principled basis for the ownership efforts. As such, these processes resemble the public consultations that the Ministry of Finance 
subjects important decisions regarding the fund. However, officials stress that these are learning rather than consultation processes. In a related manner, NGO representatives claim that their concern is to provide what they consider good language on the topic involved and references to relevant international principles. By committing the fund to a certain language and particular principles, the NGOs seek to impel NBIM to engage then on additional topics. Documentary sources reveal that there is a mutuality to these processes. For instance, UNICEF and Save the Children took part in NBIM's work on children's rights and child labor. In return, NBIM engaged in their work to develop the children's rights and business principles. Similarly, the expectation document on ocean sustainability formed part of NBIM's participation in the UN Global Compact Action Platform on Sustainable Ocean Business. According to NBIM, this included, and I quote here from their press release, companies representing industries and sectors that have activity connected with the oceans, UN bodies, and research institutions. Unquote. On top of this, they report that their expectations on the ocean forms the basis for dialogue with uh, companies and we have also used them to support our work on developing principles for sustainable ocean business with the UN Global Compact." Unquote. These statements are important <coughs> because they show that the expectations both build on and contribute to the UN Global Compact. In other words, these documents augment the international discourses on which they draw and form part. So from these sketches that I've provided, one can glimpse how NBIM's expectations emerge from and contribute to an extensive and complex communicative field and that this field involves collaborative relations between different actors. In fact, the concept of the expectation document itself resulted from such relations where portfolio companies played a crucial role. The notion of expectation first featured in a much publicized case where NBIM endeavored to eradicate child labor from cottonseed production in India. In that case, NBIM convinced a number of large agricultural agrochemical corporations of their common interests in regards to child labor, which they expected companies could, the companies could best address through cooperation and the creation and communication of joint expectations towards their suppliers and consultants. The result of this process was an industry position paper on child labor in the seed supply chain, as well as NBIM's investor expectations on children's rights. And this was the very first such document. When you dig through the public sources, you can see how NBIM around this time used notions such as principles, demands, encouragement, and incentives before they eventually settled for expectations. And these expectations that then articulate in and communicate through specific documents of the kind that is being passed around. These sources suggest that NBIM experimented with different forms and notions in pursuit of a concept and rhetoric. And that this then crystallized through engagement with corporations that later also came to involve NGOs and academic institutions. Now, the complex relational field that gives rise to these documents extends further. And this occurs when NBIM seek to communicate their expectations to the portfolio companies and other actors beyond those involved in their creation. For instance, NBIM report frequently of seminars and workshops on their expectations, 
and the international principles on which they build, and how these events include representatives from corporations, multilateral organizations, and peer investors. NBIM also used these documents in consultations by regulatory authorities for the purpose of developing international standards and principles. Finally, they send the documents to their largest holdings for their considerations, while they otherwise draw on the media to convey these expectations to the remaining portfolio companies. NBIM, in other words, use a variety of ways and means to extend the communication and learning processes that both underpin and emerge from these documents. But the fact that NBIM involve others in their expectations does not mean that the issue of sustainability is an, is an external I imposition. As I argued earlier, sustainability is rather imminent to GPFG as a fund of a particular kind. Central to this is the conception of NBIM as a universal owner that invests across markets, sectors and industries to hold shares in nearly all publicly traded corporations. NBIM recognize that companies inflict indirect costs on each other and society at large and emphasize that universal ownership exposes the fund to these costs. It is therefore in their interest that these costs factor in the, price, in the prices of goods and services. For this reason, NBIM expect corporations to understand the social and environmental impact of their activities and ask corporations how they will handle challenges such as environmental degradation and rising inequality. Specifically, the asset manager perspective states that oh, as a large long-term uh, global investor, we want to understand better how companies manage the risks um, and opportunities associated with these challenges. And they add that we use our expectation documents to guide our company dialogue. As a shareholder, NBIM direct the, direct the ex expectations at company boards, which they expect to provide a policy on the topic concerned and ensure the integration of relevant measures in business strategy, risk management, and reporting. By means of the expectation documents, NBIM seek to affect specific elements within the corporations and thereby influence their activities. Through dialogue, <coughs> they aim to shift the assumptions of boards and management to ensure that they take such challenges into account. The result is that NBIM effectuate the corporation as a malleable form that is amenable to influence through the communication of expectations. Officials sometimes suggest that the expectations and children's rights, rights stem from the fact that GPFG is a fund for future generations and that those on climate change cha are due to its capital deriving from the production of oil and gas, which contribute in this regard. A former official pointed out that one can hardly object to a regard for how corporations safeguard children's rights. This means that the issue does not require further justification. Nevertheless, there are economic arguments in its favor. For instance, that corporations run legal and re reputational risks by infringing such rights. On top of this, it can serve as a proxy for other relevant issues. For instance, that person asks whether one ought to trust the accounts presented by a corporation that has no qualms keeping children at work in a dark mine. But one can add to this that children's rights have a long political and legal history in Norway that predates its independence as a nation state. In 1896, Stortinget, for instance, passed what many considered the world's first child protection law. And in 1915, they enacted the children laws that are named after the socially radical and liberal politician Johan Kostberg. These laws established the status of children as independent legal subjects 
75 years before the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child did the same. Wittingly or not, NBIM extended its legacy when they used their expectation documents to get corporations to respect children's rights. When doing so, they influence one legal subject so that it recognizes another as such. If the first expectations emerge from the character of the fund, so officials suggest that others in turn extend from these. On their account, the documents on, on human rights resulted from a challenge that the topic of children's rights was too narrow in scope. Meanwhile, the topic of climate change gave rise to that of water management, and this in turn generated the issue of ocean sustainability. NBIM used this slide to illustrate the relationship between the expectation documents and the SDGs. As you can see, the illustration links each expectation document to a particular sust sustainable development goal, but then bundles some under further goals. The slide shows how the expectation documents co cover a plurality of the SDGs, but it also demonstrates how their topics extend from each other. Another slide groups the topics of water management, ocean sustainability, and climate change under the rubric of environmental, and it then combines those in human rights, children's rights, tax and transparency, and anti-corruption under social, and finally gathers the pos position papers under governance. Abbreviated ESG, the environmental, social, and governance are three issues for responsible investments, that serve to assess the risks of corporations and enable sustainable long-term returns. The illustration reveals how the expectation documents and position papers concern different risk factors. NBIM want corporations to account for these in their policies, strategies, measures, and modes of reporting. In other words, NBIM use these documents to influence the corporations so they manage these risks by means of their available tools and practices. And in this way, render corporations and, re and fund returns sustainable in the long term. The focus on the relationship between return and risk shows that ESG forms part of NBIM's portfolio management as, an invest as a financial investor. As these slides order the documents in different ways, they demonstrate how NBIM's expectations and positions extend from each other and thereby constitute a portfolio in their own right. Now this account reveals that NBIM's expectations regard an extensive set of issues that concern and combine phenomena of different kinds. In fact, these issues exceed their own comparison between the expectations and the SDGs. For instance, the document on children's rights raise a host of concerns that go far beyond educational opportunities. After discussing the issue of child labor, the document argues that other areas in which companies may have negative impacts on children's rights include abuse, education, decent work opportunities, and or inadequate wages for parents, healthcare, clean water, food, the right not to be estranged from family, as well as product safety and responsible marketing towards children. Here, NBIM assume a perspective that surpasses the singular issue of child labor. By contrast, they expect corporations to consider how they affect children's rights through a multitude of practices and relations that constitute the wider contexts of children's lives. Relatedly, the expectation document on human rights prompts concern for persons who may relate to the corporations in different ways and therefore may be affected by, by their practices in different ways. These include, as you can see here, employees, contract and supply chain workers, as well as customers and end users. 
Here, the perspective even extends beyond persons as it includes corporate considerations of their effects on surrounding communities and environments. Even broader, the expectation document on ocean sustainability points out that, this is a long quote, I'm sorry, the ocean covers most of the planet's surface and is a vital part of the biosphere, producing more than half of the world's oxygen and regulating global temperatures. It is an important part of the global economy, providing natural resources and open spaces for transportation and other economic activity. The importance of the ocean is said to grow as it has the potential to provide protein to feed a growing world population and accommodate offshore renewable energy production." Unquote. These quotes show that the document on children's rights co cover, covers labor, family, and gender relations, as well as educational and economic opportunities and nutritional and public health considerations. Meanwhile, the document on ocean sustainability concerns climatic conditions and physiological respiration, as well as economic production, trade and consumption, along with human and animal metabolism and energy generation. On their own, I would argue that these two documents invoke the bulk of NBIM's expectations and their links to the SDGs. Their perspectives recall the UNSDG resolution and its concern for people, planet and prosperity. They address its core elements of economic growth, social inclusion, and environmental protection. And according to the UN, these, and I quote, are interconnected and all are crucial for the well-being of individuals and societies, unquote. If one adds to this the fact that NBIM, in principle, deri direct their expectations at more than 9,100 companies in 73 countries, it becomes clear that these documents address conditions for the life and well-being of persons and other creatures around the globe and thus constitute, thus concern welfare in a broad sense. Now, when discussing management for future generations in 2006, NBIM argued that the wealth of the fund has no value in itself, but only as a means for securing a good life or welfare for Norwegians in the future. Immediately, this claim obviously concerns the use of the fund to cover the deficit of the annual fiscal budget and finance a fraction of all state expenditure, including extensive welfare services. Yet NBIM also argued that, and I quote here, a good life or welfare for Norwegians nevertheless not only concerns the welfare of Norwegians, but includes the possibilities for sharing the benefits with others in the world, unquote. They pointed out that questions regarding the constitution of a good society and the conditions for a good life are overarching concerns for politics and public administration. Yet, they also argued that these are guiding questions for moral philosophy or ethics, which may offer insights in this regard. And accordingly, NBIM experimented at this time with such ideas as a basis for, the, for their exercise of ownership. In this regard, it is also relevant that Johan Kastberg, earlier mentioned, often features as a founder of Norwegian social and welfare policies, and that he grounded these in both national concerns and notions of solidarity, justice, and neighborly love, nestichalighet. The notion of solidarity also underpinned key policies regard regarding the fund. These include the idea, initial idea that the petroleum fund, that the, sorry, that the petroleum revenues should benefit society as a whole, which later came to include future generations. So solidarity also justified that the fund invests the revenues abroad to restrain their inflationary effects. Perhaps it is therefore not surprising that an oil field now is named after Johan Kostberg. Through taxation, income and dividends, Johan Kostberg, the oil field, 
contributes funding for the welfare policies inaugurated by Johann Kostberg, the politician. Since use of the capital requires a resolution by Stortinge, NBIM may only share the benefits of the fund with others in the world by seeking to influence the companies in which they invest. Accordingly, their expectation documents inscribe the corporations with a welfare agenda that complements yet exceeds the politics and bureaucracy of the nation state. David Garland argues that the welfare state involves, and I quote, a set of social protections superimposed upon capitalist economic processes designed to modify and moralize the market economy, unquote. By contrast, NBIM enunciate expectations that seek to influence corporate policies, strategies, measures and modes of reporting, and thereby affect the modes of thinking and action in and of the corporation. The expectations are therefore not impositions that aim to rectify the shortcomings of capitalist processes. Instead, they are attempts at affecting relations and operations internal to capitalist corporations, and thereby influence their activities in the world. Relatedly, the state provides services to which citizens are entitled by virtue of legal rights and constructs programs through which individuals move according to their age and needs. By contrast, NBIM <coughs> raise awareness in and of the corporations regarding their potential impact on a multitude of subjects, communities and other beings and thus seek practically and pragmatically to influence corporate relations and activities. Moreover, the expectations raise a multiplicity of issues that may relate to the same corporate policies and strategies, but that for the state form part of distinct domains and programs. For instance, when the document on children's rights enumerates how corporations may impact children's lives, it lists concerns that fall under separate state agencies and authorities. These include uh, those for child protection, education, labor inspection, health services, sanitation, food safety, marketing, and consumer rights. One can say that the expectations cut across different government domains and state programs, yet relate to the same corporate policies, strategies, and measures. In this way, it delineates and inscribes a welfare agenda that may appear incongruent to the state, but that cohere in the eyes of the corporation. Nevertheless, these expectations do not disregard or neglect the state. After all, NBIM ground their documents in conventions, declarations, principles and processes by multilateral organizations where nation states are members and take part. Moreover, many of the issues raised by these documents require for their resolution the existence, operation and cooperation of state agencies and authorities. Accordingly, the document on tax and transparency argues that corporate taxes play an important role in public finances of developed countries and may be even more critical in developing ones. Tax is one of the ways in which businesses contribute to the societies on whose legal and, in and financial infrastructure they rely for the orderly execution of their activities." Unquote. By prompting corporations to consider tax a return to societies for the institution on which they depend, the expectations concern the enabling conditions for both corporate activities and public institutions. The expectations integrate the operation of publicly listed yet privately owned corporations with the operations of public institutions that are subject to democratic control and governance. The most significant relationship to the state results from the role the fund plays as a fiscal policy tool. As the expectations enable sustainable business practices, they afford sustainable fund returns that cover the annual budget deficit and finance a fraction of state expenditures. A recent white paper furthermore states that, and I quote, the fund and the spending rule contribute to shield the fiscal budget from short-term fluctuations in the petroleum revenues, 
and provide scope in fiscal policy for counteracting economic shocks, unquote. This means that GPFG not only contributes funding for state expenditures, it also enables counter-cyclical spending to intervene in the economy at large. Accordingly, economic policy guidelines dictate that fund withdrawals accord with expect expected real returns, but that, and I quote, they also place great weight on evening out economic fluctuations to secure capacity utilization and low unemployment, unquote. One may add to this that the fund and the spending rules serve a monetary policy purpose as they sequester the petroleum revenues to control their inflationary effects. As a combined fiscal and monetary policy tool, GPFG is integral to macroeconomic governance. It therefore pertains to the conception of the welfare state that in Garland's words, and I quote, highlights the government's regulatory, fiscal, monetary, and labor market policies and their role in shaping markets, promoting growth, providing employment, and ensuring the welfare of firms and families, unquote. So on this basis, I end now by concluding that the fund forms part of an encompassing welfare agenda. It does so through its role as a fiscal and monetary policy tool, but also through NBIM's influence on corporate thought and action. Their efforts to secure sustainable returns inscribe corporations with an agenda that reforms the concept of culture, sorry, concept of welfare, and extends the fund's custodial finance beyond the ambit of the nation state. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Knut Christian. And uh, I think this was a lot of food for thoughts. Um, I have a few sort of initial uh, comments that I would like to make, but uh, I will also very quickly open it up to the floor. But I mean, I mean, you touched upon a number of interesting and extremely important issues. I mean, one is, of course, this relationship between expectations and what actually happens in these uh, dialogue meetings and in all the resolution votings, for example. I mean, one thing is, uh, I mean, for anybody who has worked on issues concerning uh, policies and policy papers in, uh, for example, uh, multilateral institutions, I mean, one thing is having them, another thing is sort of, I mean, they, d I mean, which we have seen from the World Bank, the IMF, and other uh, of these types of organizations. Yes, I mean, to a certain extent, I mean, they do form this language also shapes policies and they do shape expectations and they do also t comes come into account in implementation decisions but there are also at times when they are put aside to put it that way so i wonder if you could say a little bit about uh, how you see that part of it uh, secondly i mean you talk about this um, i mean underneath there is something it's also some ideas about various types of social contracts. I mean, obviously, there is some sort of foundational social contract between the fund, uh, the bank, and the Norwegian population. But there are also ideas here into this uh, about a, a much larger social contract, some sort of a global social contract in a way. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. And finally, I mean, I cannot resist at least opening it up and then we'll see if other in the audience picks it up. But obviously, I mean, this also, this fund also, in many ways has transformed Norway from being a small power with its foreign policy conducted around two pillars. One is the Friedenlund Doctrine, which uh, from the 70s, which basically says that Norway is a small, small country with an open economy in a um, volatile and dangerous world. So uh, as a small power, we should invest in them uh, in sort of multilateral stability. 
The second pillar was, of course, sort of Norwegian core foreign policy interest, which is related to geography and particularly to, uh, to one particular neighbor. With this fund, Norway has in many ways become a global state with global interest. And it's, um, which sort of redefines, it doesn't take away geography from foreign policy, but it in, a, in many ways also redefines geography. And what is, what is the geographical, the component of geography in Norwegian foreign policy? So maybe somebody would like to pick up on that. But I'll stop here, and, and I would like to open up the uh, floor. Uh, Arne will be moving around with, an, uh, with a microphone. Please uh, use the microphone, talk into it, and please also, if you do not mind, state your name and an affiliation if you have one. Uh, I think we could take two, three in the first round, and then we'll see. So, please, the floor is yours. Working? Yeah. yeah. Um, Marion Gudagetveter, I'm from the Norwegian Helsinki Committee, and I have two questions for you. The first is um, about uh, climate and about um, the investments that we make. Um, the, the climate criteria has not been properly implemented because there's disagreement about how to operationali operationalize it. And um, the Norwegian NGO Framtid Nivore Henner recently um, showed that 11 of the uh, companies with the biggest climate emissions are companies where the Norwegian oil fund is a major investor. Um, I'd like uh, to hear your thoughts on that and, um, and um, also on how you see that affecting Norway's reputation. Um, which is a currency in international politics. And my second question is about the, um, um, the Council on Ethics in the oil fund, which works on an ad hoc basis. Um, what would you think, what would you see the implications being if the Council on Ethics worked on a uh, basis where they, where companies had to be pre-qualified for Norway to invest in them, for the oil fund to invest in them. Yes, please. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. I'm a social anthropologist and work currently at EITI. And uh, I have a question, I'm also not Norwegian maybe. Uh, uh, your name, please. Anna Sophie. Um, how exactly is, uh, is then the next step in uh, ensuring the implementation at the companies that they also um, take up all the uh, the issues that NBIM is, is raising and is there some sort of surveillance um, and uh, what happens if the companies wouldn't comply and the second thing is is NBIM also uh, addressing or discussing uh, whitewashing by, by companies is that uh, a topic taken up Okay, I think we let the rest of the audience think a little bit. So, you, Christian. <coughs> to start with your questions, uh, I mean the climate criterion is really falls under the remit of the Council on Ethics, as far as I understand, and it's a question of observation and exclusion. Um, so, um, for those who if you do not, if you're not aware of this, we can go back to the governance model. So the Council on Ethics does not feature here, but the Council on Ethics is an independent body, it consists of five members that are appointed by the Ministry of Finance, uh, serve on a time-limited period as councillors, and they are assisted by a secretariat, and they make recommendations to the executive board of Norges Bank regarding uh, observation, exclusion, or reintroduction of companies in the investment universe due to their conduct. And they have certain criteria where some uh, concern uh, human rights violations, um, environmental degradations, and the like. And recently they introduced a climate criterion, and there has been some disagreement um, 
with regards to how that should be interpreted, and there have been no uh, decisions yet made on the basis uh, of that criterion, even though the Council has made several recommendations, as far as I know. Uh, is, does that sound like a fair uh, account? Yeah. yeah. So, um, I'm interested in, so, when the an executive board of Nergis Bank uh, makes a decision regarding a corporation, whether it is excluded or reintroduced, that is merely to be uh, then uh, implemented by Nergis Bank Investment Management as an asset manager. And I'm really interested in, in their activities, in the activities that are uh, in, their di in their discretion to make. So uh, I'm not really that interested in the Ethics Council. I have a collaborator on my project who's looking into that, and she would probably be better uh, placed to answer that question. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not really uh, competent to answer that question. With regards to the Framtid uh, Nivare Hender report, I did see, I haven't read the report, but I've, I've, I've read the media coverage of it. Um, and I was, I was not surprised. Uh, <laughs> and the reason why is that this is really, uh, an the fact that the fund is invested in these corporations is an effect of the investment strategy and really the adoption of the benchmark index for the fund, which is decided by the Ministry of Finance. So uh, that benchmark index dictates to a large extent how the fund is invested. Um, and because of these companies uh, being so, I mean, their uh, carbon footprint is, an, um, is a result partly of what they do, but it is also a result of their size. And because these corporations are so large, the fund is mandated by strategy and by virtue of these, by these indices that are used to govern it, to invest in them. So I'm, I'm not surprised that the fund is invested in them. Um, regarding how that affects Norway's reputation, uh, well, Norway has an ex a reputation as a large oil exporter in its own right. So <laughs> and the fact that most of these countries are oil and gas producers, uh, I'm not sure to what extent it really affects our reputation that much. Uh, I don't know to what extent that report has been picked up in international media, for instance. Uh, that would be interesting to know, but I, I have not seen that. Uh, I think it might be early also to say how this is going to play out. Um, it might be that investment in, in um, big oil, for instance, is going to, the perceptions of that will change in the future, possibly. I don't know. Um, regarding the council and whether companies ought to pre-qualify for investments, um, that would be uh, difficult, I think, in the sense that it would make uh, it very labor-intensive to uh, manage the fund, um, and it would uh, drastically change the risk profile of the fund. So if you were to do that, uh, you would see probably much greater fluctuations in the market value of the fund than you see now. So that is my only, uh, I don't have a particular view on how it ought to be done. I, I note that the fund has uh, delivered very good results and those results you could not expect if you were to adopt that kind of investment strategy. But these are just questions of which strategy to adopt for the fund. Um, EITI. Um, about the implementation and the surveillance and the compliance of these expectations, uh, a lot of this work, as far as I can uh, tell, is, is being, uh, I mean, the follow-up of this is being conducted through these company dialogues. And these dialogues are uh, 
reported on to a certain extent in the publicly, but to a very limited concern having to do with the fact that they deal with you know, market sensitive information, um, corporate confidentiality, those kinds of things. Um, but that is really the, um, the arena, I would say, where the fund um, try to oversee the implementation of these expectations. Regarding the surveillance and the compliance, well, the fund is working also on expanding the kinds of reporting that uh, corporations are required to make. And those kinds of reporting, these kinds of enhanced reporting, for instance, on carbon, carbon footprint um, at the fund, from what I gather, were early to um, adopt, um, serves a purpose of uh, surveillance, obviously, and also to be able then to follow up, follow the compliance. Now, voting is also important in this regard because voting provides uh, a public arena where the fund can take positions on particular issues that might be of bearing in this regard. Um, so. One way you can follow this is to follow it through the reporting of the fund, but you can also follow it if you go on the website of the fund. You can see how they vote on every resolution in every annual shareholder meeting for each of the corporations in which it is invested. So if you, um, if you care about a particular topic uh, or you wonder you know, what position they took on this particular issue, you can go and see there. And I saw that in the new strategy for uh, NBIM, which was published last week, they uh, state that they intend to um, release the voting uh, actions before the AGMs rather than after, as they have done until now. So that gives an opportunity to see how they intend to vote before they do so. And I assume this is of significance for other investors to be able to see how this particular large investor votes. Yes, we have at least one more here, please. Hi, um, my name is Jose, I'm here as an individual newcomer to Norway. And, and I, I have two questions, one is, uh, is is there any room for improvement? Because I work in an NGO and usually when we do a report about something, we end up with recommendations on things that we think we should be improved. And what I heard, it was a picture of a p amazing product or way of working, but I didn't hear any slight, small criticism. So is there any room for improvement? Any ideas you saw that the <laughs> infant could improve? And my second question is, have you found any cases where the, the bank uses its coercive power to change things in a company, not only to make the recommendations and the vote, but has the bank, for example, pulled out from a company selling all their shares and putting the price of the shares down because of their withdrawal, because the company was not complying? Or has the bank changed the chief executive of a company because it was not willing to comply with these policies? Thank you, and then uh, could you just move it a little bit ahead? Okay, Kjetil. Uh, thank you, Kjetil Abelsnes from Norwegian Church Aid. Um, I want to thank you for, for this presentation. Uh, it's great that we have researchers that are looking into this. Um, um, as civil society, we kind of en en enjoy these uh, expectations documents, but we also are left wondering uh, what the results are, because I, I think you gave a good overview of what uh, what we are expecting and how it is kind of an expansion of the of the uh, of the nation state, but but what what are the results? So that's one question, and also a reflection. Uh, Morten, you said uh, that Norway has become a global state with this fund. I think that's that's also very interesting. We're kind of embracing the world, but what happens now when the world is kind of falling a little bit back into it into itself? Uh, will we end up in a situation where we'll have to pick the world we want? Which kind of leads me to my next question, which is that we, we are measuring and we are encouraging companies 
but we are not picking companies based on these expectations document. And do you see any way that we could do that? Can we take two more? Yes, we we'll take two more. Yes, please. My name is uh, Kjell Stamnes. I am an independent person here. Uh, when the oil fund was established, it was a very common understanding that this should not be a political tool when it came to investments. Listening to you and the expectations on a very broad range of areas here, I'm really worried about the future for this fund. Uh, don't you see a risk here that this oil fund really becomes a political tool for Norway on the global arena? Hi, thank you. My name is Sunne of the Jacobsen. I'm from Schlug Network for the Gjeldspolitik, or Debt Justice Norway. Um, I was, uh, thank you for this, very interesting, um, um, good overview of how, um, how the fund exercises its ownership in companies, but I was wondering at a more, um, at a broader level of how the management of the fund is, is being done. Have you looked at the third of the fund that is invested in bonds and have you, and if you have, <laughs> what the, what results? What results have come from that? Thank you. Then I think we give uh, Knut Christian a chance to re reply. Okay. <coughs> yeah. Well, I'll start with Jose uh, about room for improvement. <laughs> yeah, sure. There's room for improvement. Um, uh, I guess uh, your question really concerns also critique or the room for critique or my lack of critique. Uh, Critique is fine, uh, I think. Uh, my interest, but I think before you start to critique, you really need to understand what is going on. And this is really what I'm trying to do here. Uh, I admit it, I think the fund is a very interesting and intriguing institution, and I'm excited by it. Um, and I think it is uh, interesting that we as social scientists uh, also um, the limits for our excitement uh, in regards to different research topics is also interesting, I think. But yeah, sure, there's room for improvement. Um, you could think, for instance, of... Um, I mean, the, there were three expectation documents that came very early on, well, ten, ten years ago, and they came in rapid succession. And then there was a long hiatus and there were none, and then you have had several coming out. Uh, so one way to think of the expansion of, of this would be for there to be more of them. At the same time, you could think that, you know, well, if there are too many, how does that affect their effects in the, in the world as well? So I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not really an expert on that, and I'm more interested in understanding what is going on and how they're used rather than to think of uh, hypotheticals for how they could be done differently, or, um, at least at this point. Regarding the coercive powers, as you call them, yes, the fund uh, has divested from several companies. Um, it has the possibility to divest, and they do what they call uh, risk-based divestments from corporations that they consider to have unsustainable business models or practices. Um, they don't uh, announce when they do it, or they don't announce the reasons for divesting from corporations. So you don't know uh, when it happens, or which companies they involve, or for what reasons. But they do report on the number of corporations they've done this with, and what the effects of those um, divestments are for the fund. They, of course, can't report on what the effects of the divestments are in the world, because that is up in the blue. And I think that uh, you can discuss uh, the effects of divestments in order to uh, influence corporations. And I think that is a big debate on whether that really has any kind of, uh, well, the, the effect of that is highly debatable. Um, 
you asked about change of executive CEOs, I presume. That would not be anything the fund could ever do. Uh, CEOs are employed by the boards of corporations. Shareholders elect board directors. Uh, and that is the only way they can influence the management of the fund directly, is by through the election of board, direction, by board directors. Um, but of course, there are always minority stakeholders, and that is an important thing. Um, so uh, they cannot, they are not in a position to dictate companies in any way. So uh, persuasion, communication, conviction are really the key uh, processes through which they can affect them. And this notion of expectation and this tool of expectation documents um, are means for that, as far as I can see it. Um, you asked about the uh, results. Well, you said that you were wondering about the results of the company dialogue. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I have no privileged information uh, in that regard, I'm afraid. Um, but that is, that is a topic that is being brought up uh, again and again, and it seems that the fund is trying to play with ways of disclosing more of what is going on, or well, who they talk to on what topics, and possible outcomes um, without... Uh, jeopardizing the dialogue and also disclosing sensitive information with regards to companies and, and markets. Uh, so I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have any beans to spill. Um, um, you asked about, yeah, well, the question about picking companies. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that relates, yeah, I was going to say that relates to the earlier question of pre-qualification in a way. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> as I said earlier, it can be done, but it's, it would change the operation of this fund. You'd, you would have a different fund, basically. Um, and then there was the question of, it was your question about a political tool. Well, yeah, um, it depends on how <laughs> what how you define politics and the political, I suppose. Um, but uh, I think the, the the key thing is really that um, the expectations and the dialogue and the voting are justified and viewed. Uh, from the viewpoint of the performance of the companies and the financial investments. So uh, the way at least the NBIM uh, conceive of this activity and describe it is that this is purely concerned with the performance of the corporations and their ability to uh, return profits that will uh, strengthen the returns of the fund. So um, you, s you seem to be in disagreement, um, and I, so it's so it's not it's not dictated by um, the particular foreign policy, for instance, or development policy, or whatever of a given government. Uh, Dan, I'm so sorry. You need a microphone. Sorry. No, you can have a comment. Sorry. Sorry. No, as long as the dialogue is kept strictly according between uh, the oil fund and the company or corporation, according to what you say, it's okay. But the risk I see, also from your presentation, and is that the expectations towards the oil fund as such becomes so heavily politicized that that pressure overrules a little bit the type of dialogue or type of expectations on the financial issues. That's the risk I see. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think there's a, 
these are moving parts in a way. So for instance, when um, the fund I invested from tobacco um, a long time ago, and that at the time was a controversial decision, I think now people would uh, view that differently. You had a similar kind of process with regards to coal uh, a few years ago. So I think that, you know, um, I, I think that these questions are, uh, they're, they're, they're moving in a way, I think. So what, what is considered to be political rather than financial at given, any given moment is, um, is not set in stone, I think. Um, you asked about the, f the bond portfolio. Um, I haven't looked into that. Uh, I know there's a case of a certain country and a certain bank and uh, that's you have been involved with, Schlug have been involved with. Um, but uh, there are no really comparable tools for fixed income investments. Um, there have been political processes where, um, or suggestions raised in parliament that you should have some sort of um, guidelines or requirements for uh, bond investments, but they have not won to in Parliament. Um, that is as far as I know. I really want to use my small privilege as a chair here just to say, uh, just to comment on a few things. I mean, one, uh, one is this debate about whether it's becoming sort of a political tool or not. Uh, I think that, at least so far, it is not becoming. Because, I mean, you really cannot, in my understanding of, not necessarily global finance, but of the political economy in which global finance, and global investment is a part of. I mean, you have to, any good investment manager needs to understand both, uh, both finance investment and political and need to be have a view towards the future because after all I mean this is about future investments and future returns and then the uh, also paying attention to at least some of these things whether it's sort of rhetorically or in um, or in uh, in real so to speak also makes sense in a way it makes financially sense and if you look at how all of this was brought about back in the early 90s. I mean, it was brought about in order to solve one potential huge problem for Norway. And that was the oil income and how to deal with it and how to manage oil wealth better than previous countries had managed to do it. That's why this was created. Had it been created now, it probably would have been created differently. But if you look at sort of what was the starting point for this, and up until now, and if you, t if you sort of accept, as I tend to do, even though I not always like it, that we live in a market-based capitalist world, there is only one way, I think, to look at it, to look at a longer history. And that is to say that this has been a remarkable success for Norway and has been able to sort of really feed into also and hel helped us maintain the Norwegian welfare state that most of us in one way or another are dependent upon. So I mean that's an important thing to keep in mind there, I think. And then one could and should have an, a more open and more transparent debate about this fund that I, uh, that I honestly believe in because it is making important decision that, will, uh, that affects both us who live in Norway, it uh, affects the Norwegian state, and it also affects future generation. And that is something that we really need to keep in, uh, keep in mind there, that the oil fund is also some sort of a social contract, really, between current and future generations. And that is important to keep in mind, that that 
is something that lies underneath it, the solidarity between current and future generations. And one should not underestimate the importance of that and also how, in my point of view, and how I read this part of global history, how unique that part is. Uh, is. So I think that it's sort of, it's been a, are there any more comments? Then I would I sort of give you the yeah. last word as our uh, guest uh, here uh, today. Yes, please, you can have one more, yeah. tiny one. Only very quickly. I think probably then maybe a room for improvement <laughs> could be, but I want to know whether you will agree. Maybe the bank could make public the reasons why they invest from certain companies. Is it because simply the company is not profitable, which is a very, or is it because the company is not following some of the moral principles of the fund? Of the fund? Thank you. And then, Christian, you have the last word here. In what we okay, hope well will I be I a continued I dialogue. <coughs> I think I'll end by saying one thing, perhaps, which, is, which goes back to some of your comments and to some of the things that have come up in the, in the, from the audience as well. <laughs> it's the relationship between the fund um, and the Norwegian state, if you like, or the Norwegian uh, the role of the Norwegian state in the world. Um, and you mentioned the Friedenlund Doctrine and other people have mentioned our reputation in the world. Um, and one might think that the fund is some sort of an anomaly or an aberration and it, that, it's, that, that it is strange that this fund, which is so large, exists in this small country on the outskirts of Europe, um, but the fund is really an effect of the nature of the Norwegian economy. Mm. So it is because the Norwegian economy is, as is often stated, small, open and export oriented, that we could not spend the oil revenues as we earn, earned them. Um, the Dutch did in the 50s and 60s, and gave rise, which gave rise to the notion of Dutch disease, um, it ruined their economy, and that was an important lesson f when the idea of the fund was first uh, raised. Um, the British spent their oil revenues, but their economy was large enough to be able to soak them up. Uh, the Norwegian economy couldn't. So therefore, we had to do something and what they did was to create then this fund that separates the earning of the revenues from their use. And what you also need to look at is the separation between the earning of the revenues, the investment of them, and their use. And these are three different issues. And it is important to keep them distinct because often they get conflated. So people will ask the fund to do things that really pertain to the use of the revenues. But the, the use of the revenues are under the discretion of the parliament through the fiscal budget. Uh, and the, and the uh, extraction and production of oil and gas is really something that pertains to the earning of the revenues, which is also something that the fund does not govern. So it's important to keep these three things in mind, I think, when thinking about the fund. I think I'll end there. Thank you, and thanks to everybody who came this uh, rainy afternoon in uh, Oslo. I hope you enjoyed it, and welcome back uh, on another occasion to NUPI. And thanks to Knut Christian for coming here.